Hi folks, welcome to the channel, or if you've been here before, welcome back to the channel. My name is Adam, and today we're going to be making another book nook. This time it's going to be Skyrim based. Uh, specifically, it's going to be based off of the Breeze Home Player House, which is the first house you get in the game, or most likely the first house you get in the game. Uh, spoilers for a nine-year-old game, I suppose, but uh, my bad. Uh, at any rate, I thought it would make a pretty awesome, uh, awesome book nook. So, sit back, enjoy, grab some popcorn, it's gonna be a long one. And if you like what you see, consider hitting that subscribe button. First thing I wanted to do is lay out sort of kind of where I'm going to be making things. So I've got the base set up and I've squared it into the 10 different uh, sort of tile sections. Um, and then I'm laying out where I'm going to be putting all of the various pieces that I will be building throughout this entire thing. Once I've got that sorted out, I need to set up some way of making all of the sort of diamond shaped tiles on the bottom. So what I thought would work out the best was to cut an appropriately sized sheet of um, the cardstock thick uh, cardboard stuff. And then actually using the grid on my cutting mat, I can line up the ruler to make perfectly uh, one centimeter wide little tiles and then use my little ball stylus to make them a little bit messy so they're less uh, less uniform in how they lay. Then once that's done, I just go over the entire thing with a thick coat of black Mod Podge, mostly because cardboard cardstock is a uh, paint sponge. Once that's done, I'm going to hot glue it onto a sheet of XPS foam. I know that I'm going to want to add like a tea light into the middle for the fireplace, so I need to raise it up so that that will fit in without uh, sticking out too much. Once I've marked out where the pillars will be, I can put the little cross beams in using stir sticks, which will be a regular contributor throughout this video. I'm not really measuring anything here. I'm just kind of eyeballing it and then cutting it into place. And then once I have cut these and glued them down, I realized that I needed to pull one out of the second to last so that I have a spot for my little fireplace. So once I've got that glued in, I can come back through and chop that out. And then that'll give me a spot for that tea light to come through. So the only thing left to do once I've cut that little section out is to drill a hole into the bottom of my base plate and then pop the sort of surrounding plastic off of that light. Then once it sits in place, it should line up pretty perfectly. To make the rocks around the fire, I've just used a little bit of duct tape and then I'll coat that in glue. Uh, it's just standard tacky glue and then throw some rocks on top of it. Those will act as like little coals and embers. Then I can go over the entire thing with one more coat of Mod Podge just to seal it and lock it all in place. And that's basically the bottom done. The pillars are going to be made out of butter, so I'm going to take this stick of butter and chop down sort of one and a half thick centimeter chunks, which I will then cut into one and a half centimeter wide chunks. And then once I've got a sufficient number of those, I'll come back through and start shaving off the corners. I'm not too concerned about it looking a little bit messy. It's going to be a wooden pillar anyways, so just go ham on it. You can always come back and fix it up after. And we'll add a little wood grain to the surface of the foam using just a sculpting tool. Then we just need to make the sort of beam pieces, things that attach the uh, top of the shelf to the actual beam itself, which are just made out of more of that, uh, that thick cardboard. Once they're all finished, it's just a case of gluing them into the wall where you've got your uh, sort of sections for the pillars on the bottom. And then to make the little rivets or nails, I've just snipped the heads off a couple of pins, which I will press into place. Then we're going to get started on the uh, second floor's floor, I guess, the, the second level's floor. 
So I've got some double-sided tape or just some green tape wrapped around on itself. And then I'm gonna stick these down and just hold them in place. I want it to just be made out of stir sticks. So I'm going to use glue to hold them all in place. And then once this is done, I can come back through and remove that cardstock from the bottom of it. So it's just the wood itself. I've left a cutout on the bottom left side at just where the staircase will be so that I can come back through and add a staircase sort of ladder thing up to the second level. Then once I have removed all of the excess pieces that are sticking out of the side, and then I've come back through and cleaned up where the ladder comes through, it's just a case of popping that back off and it's essentially done. It's, uh, it just needs to be cleaned up a little bit and you are finished with it for the most part. Now there's a door on the left hand side that leads to like the little alchemy room or like I think it's the orphan's bedroom, something like that. Uh, no one will ever really see this, but I know it's there. So I gotta make sure it looks semi-decent. So a couple stir sticks, some dowel and a tiny little uh, wire handle and it's all set. Now one thing that annoyed me throughout this entire build was not planning ahead very well. I realized that the back walls are made of stone and this is a very flat MDF wall which doesn't for stone make easy. So what I ended up having to do was to use some of this uh, quick set hole filler uh, and then I was able to let it dry a little bit then come back through with a sculpting tool and carve some bricks out. They're not ideal, and I really wish that I had thought ahead a little bit, but once I got the Mod Podge on and then got them painted up, they actually looked decent enough for what I needed them to be. So I think we're done with everything on the bottom floor. I can coat it all in Mod Podge, and then I'm on to painting. I'll start with a light gray on the tiles and then come through with a dry brush to highlight it with varying degrees of darker shades. And then on the wall, I started with sort of a, uh, sort of a moldy green, which will be the undercoat. And then once I've got a nice thick layer of that everywhere, I'll come through with a light brown. So I think it's a bone white and like a terra color mixed together, which I will thickly dry brush over the green I don't want it to be perfect. I want it to have little streaks everywhere. And then once I've gone over it with that, uh, that sort of light brown, I'll come over the entire thing with my top coat of blue. Um, the blue needs to look like paint that's not on there very well. So this is again gonna be a pretty thick dry brush and I'm not worried about hitting in all those spots. I actually want some of that green to poke through and I want some of that brown to show through as well. Then the rest of it is all pretty straightforward. We're gonna paint all the pillars brown and make sure everything that is wood is brown and everything that is not wood is some other shade. And then I'm going to highlight it all using various degrees of lighter browns and colors like that. And then one final wash with black just to bring all the textures to the forefront. So this will be the sort of main wall in the bedroom with the doorway, which will separate the two sections of the upstairs. Just a case of measuring out sort of how high I want it, getting a good angle on the beams and then cut a door out. Um, the real pro thing here is to set that door aside and write door on it, because I know this is the perfect size and if I don't write door on it, it's gonna get used for something else. Like I'm gonna chop it up to make a chair out of it or something. So right door on it, set it aside so I know where that door is. Then it's just gluing on some more of these wonderful stir sticks. By the end of this, I'm so goddamn tired of stir sticks. I just, I'm so bored of stir sticks now. If I never see another stir stick in my life, it's one stir stick too many. To make the interior walls on the inside of the bedroom, I've just cut some sheets of the thick cardstock to the right size and then I'm gonna score some lines in it to sort of simulate wood. This will get a bit of a groove so that after I've done my Mod Podge paint over the whole thing, 
once I go through with the dry brush, it'll really start to stand out as individual beams. So the first coat was done with a pretty weak sauce brown, uh, just from like one of these craft packs. It doesn't pigmentate very pigmentate pigment. It's got poor pigmentation, um, so it doesn't actually look very good, but it does work well for like an undercoat. And then once I've gone over the whole thing with some different browns, light browns, dark browns, warm browns and cold browns, it ends up looking uh, looking pretty good for what I need it to do. Then the last step for these walls will be adding the interior beams onto everything. Again, we're back to these stir sticks, which we're going to cut and glue. Mostly eyeballing. I'm not really measuring to make sure that they are equidistant from one another, but as long as one of them looks pretty good, I can use it as a template to make sure the other ones line up. So we'll do the same thing on both sides. The top one that runs across the middle, and then I've got one that will be like a uh, leaning wall in the back of the diorama that you don't really see. It's just when you look through the door, you'll be able to see it. So I want to make sure that it's got a fairly similar look to it. I noticed when you look through the door frame, you can see some of the wall in the background and there should be a little bit of a slight cantered wall. Um, I say cantered, but that might not actually be the right term, but I didn't want to say leaning again because it seems like I've said leaning far too many times already. So we've got a little leaning wall that I've glued in so that when you look through the doorway, you can see this and it just adds a bit more to the illusion of it being a slanted roofed house. Then we're back to painting. Uh, another recurring theme in this build was putting things together before I painted. So trying to paint within the lines was a bit of a pain in the ass because I'm more just to throw paint on and hope it looks good. So having to try not to paint all these beams, as you can see from the black, didn't work out very well. But, you know, it's an old Scandinavian house, so I'm not too concerned about a little bit of paint everywhere. Same blue I used on the walls downstairs. And I'm going to take some of that blue and also paint where the wall would show on that second level. I know that it's supposed to be brick when you look through here, but I can't be bothered making more of these bricks. So we're going to stick with what I have and you know what it ends up looking pretty, pretty sharp. So the idea is to assemble the top frame separately so that I can just slot it into place once I've got everything else attached. So I'm going to put my two walls onto each of the sides and then once they've hardened in place I can glue the roof on uh, and then it's just a case of popping that into the section that it needs to go in. You can see on here where I've cut the slots for what I had hoped would be like the shafts of light coming through. Um, I was going to put some LED strips behind this, but they didn't give off a good enough light and I didn't have the time or the aptitude, unfortunately, to figure out how to make that look as good as I wanted it to, so they end up just getting covered up. Now we're on to what was easily the longest part of this entire build. Um, throughout the entire like filming process, I was concerned about how I was going to make all this furniture and keep this video under an hour long. Thankfully, the gods of corrupted SDs kicked in and helped me out by destroying almost all of the video that I had recorded for this. So uh, I made every single piece of furniture by hand. It is a slow and tedious process, but you do end up with some unique and interesting little pieces that you wouldn't get with a 3D printer. I was referencing photos and actually just some gameplay from people wandering around in Bree's home. I really wanted all of the pieces to be as accurate as what you would find in the game when you first go into it. So this is me trying to make the various bookshelves and chairs and little odds and ends. Uh, and I think it got pretty close. There's a couple pieces that are missing mostly because I made them and then I lost them which is the true danger of working with tiny things, they tend to go flying off of your shelf or you throw them out thinking they're garbage. 
I'm very bad for throwing away things I've been working on without realizing that that is something I've been working on. I might look at it the wrong way and think it's a piece of trash, which probably says something about the stuff I make or the quality of the things I've made, but hey, what are you going to do? You got to start somewhere, right? What I've learned is that you don't need to be limited by the size of the stir sticks. You can always cut them in halves and quarters and even smaller pieces if you really truly hate yourself. This is just the hanging rack that will sit above the fireplace and will hold the, I think it's like garlic bulbs and various bits of herbs and greens and grasses and whatever other things are hanging off of it. Now, my original painting for the floor, it looked pretty good, but I wasn't really happy with it because it didn't match the rest of the wood. So what I'm going to do is take this nasty swamp brown mud that I had for painting all the other stuff. It's just like, it's a collection of all the worst colors I could find, and I kind of mixed them together, and it makes for a pretty good undercoat, really. Like, once you've thrown this on there, you cover up that really nice reddish hue with just an awful, awful brown. However, when you come back through with the dry brush, it looks terrific. So at this point, I'm just on to doing that undercoat on all the little pieces. Here you'll actually get to see all the things I made that I lost all the video for. I was super pleased with this table in particular. Look at how adorable those, uh, those cross beams are and the X legs. And it's even got like a little uh, little breadboard top, little breadboard ends on the top of it. It's just, uh, you know, I'm both happy that I lost all that footage because it means you don't have to sit through six hours of me making these things, but I'm a little sad because I spent a long time making it. This is the bookshelf that'll go on the side in the front. You'll notice in the final project that that is missing. I think I stepped on it actually, and I just couldn't be bothered remaking a new one after all this. And then just all the little bits and pieces bunch of shelves to go up. Uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, little benches. There are quite a few chairs to make, some little coffee tables, and various accoutrements. Then the final stage before dry brushing is to coat everything in a nice thick layer of black wash. Do the floor and then do all the individual pieces of furniture as well which will really highlight all the cuts and scratches in that wood the beauty of using these stir sticks is that they're real wood so they have a wonderful grain texture as much as i hate them i really do hate them now and then we're on to the dry brush this is when this floor really started to look awesome this might be one of my favorite things I've ever made, just because it looked so good by the end of it. So I went over it with sort of a lighter brown, which really started to highlight everything. And you can see all the dark spots where that wash has dried in really nicely. And then once I'd gone over with that slightly lighter brown, giving it a bit of time to dry, I'll come back through with almost like a bone white uh, dry brush. And I mean, look at, just just look at that. Is that not a floor that you would want to walk on? Do the same thing with all of the tables and chairs and little pieces of furniture. Oh God, look at my fingers. This is why I hate doing any painting without gloves. Like it just grosses me out. As I had mentioned before, a recurring theme for this build is not painting things ahead of time. And I really, really wish I'd thought about what I was doing because now I need to paint all of these beams, that same nasty muddy brown, which is almost a wash. Like it's really thin so it can easily seep out of the uh, sections you're painting and kind of add a pretty awful cast onto everything, which is why I have that little Q-tip beside my hand on the right-hand side there. If it does come out, because it's nice and thin and watery, it's pretty easily uh, sort of soaked up using that Q-tip. Easiest process to avoid would be just paint them ahead of time. Now we just need to finish that little fireplace, so we'll do a little yellow undercoat and then realize it should have been a red undercoat, and then come back through with those yellow highlights again, and then I've got just the teeniest, tiniest bit of cotton that I'm going to soak in like a yellow wash to give it a yellowish hue, because it seems crazy to use this airbrush just to brush something that tiny. 
So a little bit of soak in yellow, and then a little bit of a highlight with some black to give it sort of a smoky look. And that's it done. Now I've also made an adorable bed. The bed's, bed's again, as I say it every time, one of my favorite things. But I've got some of this leftover. It's a bamboo cloth that is meant to be reusable, but because I use it for paints, you can never actually wash it out. So I've chopped off a little bit of it, which I will glue on, and then a nice dark brown and a little yellow, and it looks like a wonderfully uncomfortable Skyrim hay mattress. And then I cut out a couple more pieces that are sort of animal peltish in shape, and then some nice uh, sort of washes of various colors will make those look like little animal pelts. Or big animal pelts, I suppose. The one on the left is pretty big. Um, once those are somewhat dry, I'm just going to drape them over the bed, and that will give me a pretty awesome looking little animal pelt bed thing. Very uncomfortable. And then to make the pillows, I've cut some thin strips of paper towel, which I've rolled up and then dipped in some thinned out Mod Podge, and just basically let them dry in their own place. Now I won't make you sit through the torture of watching me make a thousand individual cups and tomatoes, but I do want to show you how I made the little potion bottles because they were kind of fun. I mean, I, I felt like a glass blower for a little bit. So a little bit of hot glue I've dabbed out into a ball and then using tweezers, I've pinched the top so that I can pull it up into kind of a bottle-esque neck strand and then blowing to the point where I was starting to get dizzy, I cooled it down enough to snip the tip and then you're left with what is a pretty awesome tiny, tiny potion bottle. And then I went through and painted them. The first couple are going to be some, is it Alto wine or whatever it is? So they'll be painted green with that sort of lattice work brown down on the bottom. And then I made a couple more that were purple and blue and red. I think red's, red's your health potion, blue's a mana, and purple is, ooh, I think purple's poison. Maybe I shouldn't have put purple in there. Whatever, you got poison in your house now. Then we're on to my favorite part. Easily the best part of the entire build for me was putting all the things on the shelves. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I don't own things and I don't own shelves, but putting things on shelves is super exciting for me. So I've got all the little pieces that I can put on all the various shelves. Obviously, lots of mugs and lots of cheese wheels because it wouldn't be a Skyrim world without cheese wheels. Bread loaves, various potions, steaks, this will be your dinner table with cheese wheel, obviously. Then the table, a couple tomatoes, because there's tomatoes everywhere in that game. Everywhere you look, there's tomatoes. They've got those great big cast iron pots everywhere. More mugs. A lot of mugs mostly because I made so many mugs. I didn't mean to make that many mugs, but uh, alliterations are awesome. And we're going to keep going with that. A random green gourd because... And lots of books and scrolls because it's Skyrim and you need lots of books and scrolls. Now, before I started anything else, I wanted to run the wiring for the lights. So I'm going to drill a little hole in the back of this pillar, and that will be where my tiny, tiny LEDs come through. So I've got a couple on the bottom level, which I will glue a little bit of wood onto to simulate sort of that wall sconce at the back. And then I've run a final one up through the back of this bookcase, which will be on the second level. And then I've hit it behind some candles so that I can pretend like it's a candle, and then of course I've put all the stuff onto that shelf to make it a little bit more lively. The carpets are all just printouts of um, like DDS files that I found off of the Nexus, uh, Skyrim's modding site, which are essentially real rugs from in the game, but I just printed them out and coated them in a thin PVA and then slapped them down so they'll hold in place. And then referring to the in-game references, I'm just going to start putting everything where it kind of ought to be. So these wooden logs are in place of that bookshelf, which again, I lost. But I figure if it's a fireplace, you're going to need logs somewhere. So we'll throw those down anyways. They don't look out of place. The little weapon rack in the corner was meant to have some weapons in it, except the ones that I made were far too large, like they were three times the size what they should have been. So I scrapped that and thought, you just bought the house. There's nothing in it yet. There's just the random 
bits of clutter, tomatoes everywhere. In order to get everything set up on the second level, I wanted to glue one side in, but leave the other side still open so that I can come back through and add anything that I have yet to add in. I love these shelves though. These shelves are adorable, like the little bottles on them. There's the little tray with, again, more tomatoes and little scrolls and that sort of thing. I think they really add to it. The gouges on the right there are from where I tried to add some windows in and I thought that I could take some of my carving tools and carve out the windows and I realized that I just it just looked funny and I knew that there were going to be books in the way so not a whole lot of room for them. That's the leaning wall I was talking about which will be mostly invisible but there's going to be a little section you can see through the doorway. So once I've glued the bookshelf in with that light I can drop the top part, I guess, the entire upper room into place and then glue that down. Now, unfortunately, because of the way that my studio is set up, it was kind of hard to get proper lighting in to show you how everything gets stuck in place. But this will get added in all the pieces you would expect to. So there's a little chest up there. There's going to be a tiny chair in the back. The bed is sort of front and center. The uh, blurry bed, apparently. Uh, it's focusing on that beautiful, beautiful set of potions in the back, but whatever. Had a couple more of the furs lying around, so I will throw them onto the chest. And I think there was one on the back wall to give it like a wall mounted uh, pelt. Then the absolute final piece once I've checked everything is to put my little hanging thing in place. And then once I'm finished, I'll come through and hang a little bit of garlic and I don't know, we'll call it time off the uh, off the thing itself. Ready to attach the wall, which will get glued in place. And then it's just a case of waiting for that to dry. Now, as you do when you wake up first thing in the morning, you come and look at all the things you've done and decide, ooh, I don't like that anymore. So what I did is I chopped the sides off and cantered the walls. So I leaned them in so that I could have it look like the external part of the house. In hindsight, I wish that I hadn't done this just because it was so much more work. Like, I was basically done at this point. And then I decided, well, I gotta add shingles to it because you can't just have nothing on the outside. So I took my little, uh, the chopper one and started chopping off shingles. And 16 hours later, I had all of these stir sticks and I began what would become the most tedious project I may have ever set out to do. And I cried. The entire time. And then I remembered that there are two sides to this house, so I repeated this entire process again. And it looks great. I think it looked terrific by the time I got finished and I added that little bit on the top and I added all the little uh, details along the sides and the front. But given that this is mostly going to be obscured by books, it probably didn't need to be done. Um, but hey, go big or go home, right? I made a delightful little stone facade to put on the front of it, and then I cut some little pillars that I thought would look nice on the front just to hide some of that nasty MDF. Put a couple bits on the sides and then that little bit up the front. And then again that mud brown to cover everything and a little highlighting with a lighter brown and a sort of bone white brown. Oh, there's bone white brown. Um, but that was it. That's basically it finished. So that's the entirety of Breeze Home done. And now we're just on to the, uh, the glamour shots, so enjoy.
There you have it, a Breeze Home Book Nook. I had a hell of a time making this one, and I hope you like the final product as much as I do. If you did, let me know in the comments and make sure to subscribe for more of this kind of stuff. But I will see you next time otherwise. Cheers. Thank you.